Okay. Okay, I am calling to order a meeting of the Planning and Economic Development Committee on Monday, April 3rd at um, 7.01 in the chamber. And um, Alderman Moriarty, the clerk, informed me he had a conflict with this evening's meeting, and so he would not be able to be here. So, um, Alderman McCarthy? Present. Alderman Lopez? Here. here. And Alderman Clemens? Here. And Alderwoman Melissa Golia, we have a quorum. Um, so, public comment, seeing none. This evening we have um, Paul Shea from Great America Downtown um, with a presentation. And so we are going to start with that. Um, and Paul, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I'm the executive director for Great American Downtown uh, here in Nashville, New Hampshire. I am going to give you a presentation that we delivered uh, to the general public a couple weeks back um, at our annual public meeting, uh, which is the second time that we've held that meeting. Uh, it's a good opportunity for the public to catch us and, and uh, you know, review the things that we've done in the year um, that has just passed and what we've got coming up in the year ahead. Um, and also to give feedback on our programming. Um, and so we'll jump right in. Uh, so who are we? Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission centered around vibrancy in downtown Nashville, New Hampshire. Um, our mission statement is, uh, Great American Downtown is a nonprofit organization whose purpose is to provide coordination, collaboration, and partnerships that unify the entire Nashua community around a common vision for an attractive downtown that is vibrant, viable, and truly reflects the character of our city. Excuse me, Paul, I don't know why, but it's flashing. Is it flashing? Yeah. Let me jiggle the cord here. Okay. Has it stopped? Yep. Yeah. That looks Wonderful. For the moment. <laughs> All right, I'll try not to hit any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how are we funded? Uh, we are funded by the city of Nashua uh, in, in 2000. In 16, um, our uh, gross uh, receipts for the year uh, exceeded $200,000. Um, we received support from the city of Nashua um, in 2016 uh, to the tune of $35,000 um, for our general operations, as well as $10,000 uh, for a um, uh, uh, lighting project that we managed uh, for holiday lighting this year. Um, that comes out of the general budget. Um, the city of Nashville also seeded a uh, fall music festival this past year, uh, which uh, went really well. Uh, we have actually been able to uh, uh, secure private funding to have that event recur this fall. Uh, the city also supported us by way of the Downtown Improvement Committee um, to uh, send funds to support the lighting project as well. The total lighting project um, was about $27,000, uh, 25 of which uh, came from the city of Nashua. Uh, we also um, are supported very much so uh, by sponsors for events and programs. Uh, the Winter Holiday Stroll, for example, um, is one of our larger sponsor-supported events, um, and we raised over $40,000 uh, from private uh, businesses and small donations um, uh, you know, donations of all level to support that event and operations of the organization. Um, th throughout our year of programming, uh, we have a, a whole host of, of partners that help us out and make those things possible. Uh, we also operate a number of events uh, which generate revenue. Uh, in 2016, we held the Taste of Downtown. Uh, it was the 22nd year, I believe, um, and that event generated a net of $24,000 uh, which supports our organization. Um, and uh, we also held the Farmer's Dinner, uh, which was a 300-person, um, seven-course meal, uh, farm-to-table dinner on Main Street, uh, prepared by local chefs um, in partnership with the Farmer's Dinner business. Um, that event generated uh, revenue for the organization as well. Um, we have a number of programs. Some of them are geared more so towards raising funds. Uh, some of them turn a very... Uh, narrow um, uh, revenue. Um, we seek to not have any programs that operate at a loss, uh, if at all possible. 
Uh, we also received individual contributions. Uh, that was something that we were a lot more active uh, with regard to um, this, this past year. Uh, we've received um, over $5,000 in support uh, from the public with small donations, which was really great. Um, during uh, the holiday season, uh, when the holiday stroll took place, uh, we raised thirteen hundred dollars, for example. Um, you know, asking folks, "Hey, you really enjoyed this? Um, could you help to support it and make what we do possible?" Um, so we we greatly appreciate the support of the public, uh, the city of Nashua, um, and our our sponsors uh, and those who patronize our events. Uh, what are we known for? Um, in in Many years um, prior, uh, we've been known for a set of four core programs. Uh, the Nashua Farmers Market, uh, the Taste of Downtown, uh, the Winter Holiday Stroll, uh, as well as downtown marketing and events, uh, primarily um, restaurant weeks uh, were a big thing that we were uh, involved with. Uh, we have worked to grow our programming a good bit. Uh, over the past two years, uh, we've been very aggressive in building out um, our programs that we conduct. Um, so in 2015 and 2016, new programs included uh, the Downtown Scarecrow Program, uh, which features a set of about 30 scarecrows that are decorated by downtown businesses and community organizations, uh, which photos of which are taken, uh, folks go to social media and vote on them, um, and then we give out uh, nice little trophies with pumpkins at the top. Um, but that's a, that's a point of interest downtown during the, the fall season. Uh, Gate City Community Gardens, uh, which is an organization that I founded with a group of folks, including Alderman Lopez, uh, James Veo, who now works in economic development, uh, Holly Klump, and, and Mike Chenard, and a couple of other folks um, really worked to build that up. Um, to reduce the overhead, um, and as it is within our mission uh, for a more vibrant downtown community, uh, not just in the, the core of uh, downtown on Main Street, but uh, as well as enhancing the quality of life in our downtown neighborhoods, uh, we have worked to uh, bring that program into Great American Downtown. Yes? You forgot Richard Maynard. Oh, uh, and Richard Maynard, of course. Um, and uh, Tabitha Hughes, um, and am I forgetting anybody else? No, uh, but um, so so we uh, we brought that into Great American Downtown. That reduced overhead in the area of insurance, uh, as well as the operational overhead for a, a nonprofit. Generally speaking, uh, it also allows us to leverage the 501c3 status of Great American Downtown, um, which uh, will help to um, uh, get grants for that program, uh, which would not otherwise be available. Um, the Main Street Farmers Dinner, uh, we have conducted, uh, last year was our second time doing that event, which we touched upon earlier. Uh, the Eat Local Fall Food Festival, uh, which is a, um, a stand-in for Restaurant Week. Um, Restaurant Week has become a very uh, ubiquitous concept, um, so uh, to kind of help us stand out uh, and to build into our tagline of Eat, Shop, Live Local, uh, we have worked to develop this event uh, ties into our farmers market, um, our Main Street Farmers Dinner, um, as well as uh, connecting our farmers market vendors with our local restaurants uh, to use produce that is locally sourced um, and celebrate all of that around harvest time. The Nashua Farmers Market has grown significantly over the past two years. Uh, we've taken that market from a six vendor market uh, and built it up to a 30 vendor market. Uh, we now have uh, beer and wine sales, uh, locally uh, brewed beer and wine sales and tasting. Uh, we've brought in a few downtown uh, businesses to participate in the market, including Judge Bell's, um, as well as Cava Divino. Uh, Nashua Shoe Repair has also joined us uh, this past summer, uh, showing off some of his things and, and kind of uh, greeting folks in the community when he first arrived. Um, and that has been uh, a great program. This past year, uh, we have been executing a farmer's market promotion program grant uh, in partnership with the NRPC uh, to put out a, a, a very robust set of uh, advertisements. Uh, we, we've done advertising on NPR, uh, senior-focused magazines, uh, every door direct mail. Uh, we have also, as part of that grant, uh, worked to build up our um, SNAP EBT capability to ensure that we are able to serve 
uh, low income populations um, in downtown. Um, on the north end of downtown, uh, it's, it's a pretty good distance. Uh, you know, you've got Shaw's um, on the, the southern end of Main Street, uh, but it's, it's still tough to get to a grocery store from many of our downtown neighborhoods. Um, that program has helped us um, fill in the gap uh, for food accessibility uh, for folks. The, yes? It, how, how successful was that? We, like how, how many sales yeah. did you get from that? So over the course of the season, uh, we did a total of, a, of just shy of $1,100 in sales. Uh, but we also, uh, in partnership with the New Hampshire Food Bank, uh, participated in the Granite State Market Match Program. Uh, the Granite State Market Match Program uh, is, is kind of a grant to us, uh, which allows us to uh, match dollar for dollar uh, folks that come in for SNAP EBT. Okay. Um, so it, it helps um, them meet their mission, uh, but it also helps us um, uh, meet the needs of folks who are having food insecurity issues. Uh, yeah, so so that's that's about twenty two hundred dollars in total sales of produce, which, I mean, it, it adds up. Um, yes, Tom. I just wanted to observe Alternate. that food stamps isn't exactly a flowing river of milk and honey. So if someone's getting fifty dollars a month and they're spending it there, then that's probably represents a lot of people. Thank you. Um, so so that's that's been great. Uh, as part of that grant, uh, we've also been uh, exploring the feasibility of a winter farmer's market uh, location. Uh, the National Regional Planning Commission has uh, evaluated a number of sites. Um, they've also done uh, some outreach to our consumer base uh, through online surveys. They've also come down to the market uh, to do in-person surveys to determine uh, if a winter market uh, would be of interest. Um, the uh, results of that are still pending, uh, but it, it is, I'm fairly confident uh, that it's going to point to a demand. Uh, the, the question on feasibility will really come down to um, accessibility of a space. Um, some, some winter markets um, operate in partnership with a greenhouse or um, some other seasonal facility um, that might not be heavily used in the winter. Um, and so trying to find something like that um, or a, a property that would be otherwise uh, accommodating and um, uh, amenable to hosting us um, will, will kind of help to answer whether or not that's possible um, in this coming winter. I'm um, hoping that by mid-summer uh, we can lock in with a good degree of confidence. Uh, if we'll be moving forward with that, uh, that will give our vendors ample time to plant uh, winter crops. Uh, the Nashua Farmers Market has also grown to two days a week. Uh, we had uh, expressed interest from the general public um, about uh, having a second day of the week at the market. Uh, we added a Wednesday evening market uh, that goes from 4 to 7 p.m., um, and we have several vi vendors that have signed on for it this year. Uh, we had uh, to do a lot of push, uh, a lot of advertising push to get folks aware of that. Um, towards the end of the season, we were able to uh, get up to around 100 folks coming out. Uh, of course, on the Sunday market, we have six to 800 people that come out. So, so there's a big difference, and I think we've got a lot of room for growth. Uh, but this, this gives folks the opportunity to do week-round shopping. Um, you know, some of the, some of the veggies may, might not last seven days. So to give you that midweek um, is nice, especially when you're trying to eat local. Um, we're also hopeful that that will help to build the connection between farmers and our downtown restaurants. Um, the... Uh, I'll, Take a moment. Any questions on all that stuff so far? All right. So the Nashua Street Pianos program, uh, we rolled out for the first time this past year. Uh, Littleton, New Hampshire, and, and communities throughout the world are uh, conducting a program that's been inspired by uh, Luke Jerem's Play Me, I'm Yours, uh, which uh, initiated in the UK. Uh, Boston, Massachusetts does a set of about 70 street pianos in September. Uh, this past year, uh, our program is a, a little bit unique because our uh, pianos are out for a very long duration. Um, this past year, we had two pianos uh, that were out from May through October, uh, which was incredible. Uh, I get to applaud our, our piano tuner, Frank Nelson, who was out there every two weeks uh, tuning the pianos to make sure that they were kept up and playable over the course of the season. Um, this year, we'll be looking to add a third piano. Uh, yes? Where is the third piano going? Or where... So, the locations so we haven't finalized the locations yet. 
Um, the Bicentennial Park location uh, will certainly be one. Uh, one of the pianos was stationed at uh, the corner of um, uh, Pearl Street and Main Street, uh, right by um, Old Nashua Bank, Lake Sanofi Bank. Um, but there is a street sign where that piano was now, so we probably won't put it there. Uh, we're going to look for alternate locations. Um, one space that I think would be uh, a pretty good fit, um, we've still got to talk with, uh, with the folks over at uh, Department of Public Works to finalize approvals. Uh, but there is a uh, set of two planter beds outside of um, uh, outside of Main Street uh, Giro, which uh, are in the furnishing zone. There's a tree in the middle of them, but there's a very there, there's probably about ten feet between the two planter beds, so that may be a good location. Um, and we were initially thinking about having one down by City Hall. Uh, but if we have one at Main Street Giro, we may look to have one uh, perhaps either at Railroad Square um, or uh, some alternate location, maybe um, around the area of, uh, I'm trying to think, um, the Martha's Exchange block, perhaps on the other side of the road. Uh, but it's still a moving target. Um, it, it will depend on how we, we are still lining up our third piano. So. You know, the difference of four to eight inches in width of a piano can, can impact uh, whether or not we can place things in certain places. Um, <coughs> uh, so that was a great program. Looking forward to growing it this year. Uh, we worked with uh, City Arts Nashua, who uh, sponsored the program uh, through a financial contribution. Uh, Positive Street Art provided artists, which was fantastic. Um, so it was a pretty, uh, it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, a lot of work keeping them covered whenever the rain came. Uh, but our, our we had Basil working with us, and we had downtown shops that I could count on to call um, and cover them up. That's that's the biggest trick to the whole thing. Um, the National Pride Downtown Parks Cleanup Day, uh, we've conducted that for the past two years. Um, this event was inspired by the big day of serving, uh, which was a, uh, a huge, huge spring cleanup day, a service day. Uh, that was conducted by a variety of faith-based organizations for two years, uh, maybe about four or five years back. Um, we have worked to uh, build this uh, spring cleanup day to help uh, clear a lot of the detritus that builds up over the course of the winter. Um, the snow banks melt, and all of a sudden, all of the uh, the litter and and uh, you know fallen limbs and things all become exposed. Um, this year, we're conducting that on April 22nd. Um, we had 80 folks in the first year. Uh, we had somewhere between 120 and 150 folks in the second year. Um, and we were able to uh, clear almost the entirety of the rail trail, um, as well as some of Library Walk um, and a couple of other pocket parks. Um, this year, we, are, we have a goal of attracting 225 folks uh, to come and join us. And we're also adding a third uh, kind of meetup spot for this event um, at Mine Falls Park. Um, we have uh, we have folks meeting at Library Walk and at City Hall um, and with uh, the uh, footbridge coming to Mine Falls Park, uh, Great American Downtown has grown uh, more and more interested in being of service to, uh, to help with the Mine Falls Advisory Committee with uh, some of the volunteer recruiting. Yes? Which entrance to Mine Falls were you looking at? Um, you know, I, I know that uh, Positive Street R has a race that day. Um, we, I'm open to uh, Mine Falls entrance, uh, you know, alternate entrances. Just checking. Yeah. So we, now, where are you guys uh, out of? Are you down by? We were doing the Mill Yard entrance by the Nimco building for oh. the Hearts and Minds um, 5K. Okay. So that, so that will not be it then. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I. If I might make a suggestion, it's yes. farther down the trail, but if you use the one over by the Boys and Girls Club, it might be accessible to Boys and Girls Club people who want to volunteer. That's a great idea. Thank you very much. Um, so that, that's been a great program. Um, the holiday lighting program that we conducted this past year, uh, we formed a committee. Uh, uh, we had some uh, aldermen, business folks, um, uh, in, and we worked through uh, reviewing a set of products, evaluating costs, uh, trying to see uh, what we might be inspired by in other communities through photos and through, um, you know, just looking at what's out there. Um, 
we ended up selecting a set of uh, Garland products uh, for the, the poles up and down Main Street. Uh, we also uh, got a set <laughs> of orb products that hung in the trees, uh, which kind of complemented each other nice. Uh, we also got a small number of um, colored uh, spotlights. Um, and so we set those up at key locations. Uh, the Hunt Memorial Building um, had some light um, kind of uh, colored up lighting. Um, we are actually using some of those colored spotlights now uh, to illuminate second story spaces that are either vacant or have uh, businesses that are amenable uh, to enliven the evening a little bit. Um, so if you're downtown and you see um, uh, across from, um, across from SFK, um, excuse me, across from um, the, the Chase Building. The Chase Building has a few windows that are lit up. Um, the building that the Telegraph now owns uh, has an art studio up there that has some of the lights. Uh, we've also got some in our office, so trying to put those to use in the off season. Yes? Um, <clears throat> how well did the lights hold up and, and you know, how many of them are now no longer? <laughs> So far as I can tell, there may have been one or two of the orb products that got broken um, just because they were dropped. Um, uh, but we, I, th I think we picked up 140 of those. Um, the um, Garland products are, are very sturdy. Um, they're, they're like a sealed LED product. Um, so I was really happy with, with those. Um, and I have no uh, indication that any of those have uh, had any trouble. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we were very um, we were very diligent in kind of reviewing all of these things. We uh, we ordered a couple of samples, um, and so um, we we had I think like seven hundred dollars worth of samples come in, different orbs and different things. And some of them were just we we figured that they would be too heavy when we finally got them for the trees to support them. You know, in their younger years. Um, some of them were just garishly huge, um, you know, a 20, 24 inch orb, um, you know, when, when you really, <laughs> when you get it in your hands, it's a pretty big thing. And, and so uh, we were we were going for uh, more of a, a homey kind of warm holiday feeling and not Willy Wonka. So we sent those back. Um, but yeah, they, they held up very well. No, that, that's, that's good to know, because I know that, you know, a lot of money was put into it. I know a lot of effort was put into making sure that we got ones that were going to be durable but you know you can put all your time and energy into some things sometimes and they don't work out so it's nice that it's nice to hear that um you know that they're around for next year too so yeah and, and uh you know the dpw is great in in uh, uh kind of storing all of those uh we retained all of the boxes for the orbs um so that way they could be put back into the styrofoam uh protective casing uh, we also purchased a set of, uh, gosh, I think 50 42-gallon Rubbermaid containers. That was an interesting Great. shipment to receive. <laughs> um, and so they'll be properly stored over the winter uh, to, you know, to be kept free from dust and critters. And, and so um, it, that's, it's good stuff. Yeah, we, we, we definitely want to make those last. Uh, we, we could certainly use more, uh, but that's not something that we want to see money go to you know, throw away each year. Mm -hmm. We want it right. to last. So um, so that was great. Um, the Downtown Fall Music Festival, uh, which was, again, this was an event that was seeded um, through an escrow allocation last fall. Um, that event, uh, we estimate, over the course of the weekend, attracted six to 800 people. Um, there were no more than 300 people um, out for that event at any given time, uh, but we only had about three or four weeks of lead time to advertise it, so I was quite happy with that. Uh, the production was very good. Um, we had uh, Ben Rudek from Riverwalk Cafe uh, volunteering with us to produce that event, um, who, whom we have since hired uh, to be our arts coordinator. Um, and that event coincided with the Eat Local Fall Food Festival, um, though this coming year it will stand alone. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, the Let Freedom Ring, for the past two years, uh, we have conducted a patriotic sing-along and picnic in partnership with Mary Goyette um, and uh, all of her great friends, Bill Sturgeon, uh, Mike Lochi, uh, coming out, and we bring tents and help to support that event and promote it. Um, and, and we've had about uh, 40 to 50 people come out the, for the past two years for that. Uh, it's usually uh, somewhere around the 4th of July, but not on that day. 
uh, the Sights and Sounds Spring Arts Festival. Uh, we had about uh, three to 500 people come out for that, that fest festival, which also served as the, um, the rollout for the street pianos. Um, we'll talk more about how that event has evolved um, in just a little bit. Uh, we've engaged in a variety of cultural festivals, uh, working with a number of folks who are interested in cheering and celebrating their culture with the rest of the community. Uh, we worked with the Richelieu Club on an event um, two years back. Uh, we worked with the Indian community to help promote um, the celebration of democracy on Indian Independence Day. Um, and that has been, um, that has been good. Uh, there are a lot of folks in the community uh, that have a uh, good bit of very interesting cultural stuff to share. Um, and, and I believe, you know, personally, that the more that we see of that, um, the more we get to know about each other and the stronger we are as a community. Um, the chocolate stroll, uh, for the past two years, we have either had terrible snow or terrible cold uh, <laughs> for the chocolate stroll, but we still have had uh, somewhere in the ballpark of, I think the first year we had 120 people. This past year it was closer to 80. Um, so to me that indicated that uh, people are more likely to come out even if it's bitter cold, but if it's snowing at all, um, they'll the event will be impacted. Um, of course, they had chocolate to fuel them um, to, to keep them warm as they go around. But um, that event, uh, retailers set up uh, chocolate samplings, fondues, um, uh, various uh, different treats, and, and folks go around. It's timed uh, just before Valentine's Day, uh, and it's an opportunity to go out on a date or out with friends, uh, but also an opportunity to, to check out um, our uh, distinctive retailers. Alderman Lopez. It's just my impression this year that the chocolate stroll was advertised um, much closer to the event kickoff. So it may just be that more people needed to know about it. Could be. It, that is possible. Um, and the downtowner. Uh, so the downtowner is a newsletter uh, that we send out every week. Um, the subscriber list, I do believe, exceeded 4,400 um, just the other day. Um, and so we're. we're petering up around the 4,400, 4,500 range, uh, which has been great. Uh, we get a very good open rate on that. Uh, it's somewhere between 30 and 36 percent, depending on the headline or if there's a school vacation or something like that will impact the open numbers. Um, but that has been a, uh, a great resource. You know, there are only so many programs that we can add on and conduct, but there are a wealth of organizations that conduct cultural programming, all sorts of exciting stuff. Um, you know, businesses hosting live music. Um, the more that we can highlight that and bring that to the rest of the community, the things that are already happening, um, the, the better off um, downtown will be. <coughs> All right, so how we have grown. Um, we have uh, brought on a number of new board members. Um, so Cheryl Lindner uh, the, from the Silver Knights uh, is our board president. Uh, Ryan Ruggiero uh, is the treasurer. Uh, he's of Triangle Credit Union. Uh, Deputy Chief Glenn McDonald has joined us as the designee of the fire chief. Uh, Sergeant Tom Bolton has joined us as the designee of the police chief. Um, and f kind of for a refresher, if you are not aware, um, our board's composition uh, by virtue of our bylaws um, includes a designee of the mayor on the full board. Uh, the mayor sits in advisory role on our executive committee. Uh, the police chief uh, and the fire chief also have a designee on the board. Um, and those are seats without limits. Um, they are just uh, as a matter of designation. Uh, Deb Rapsis uh, from St. Patrick's Church has joined us. Uh, Carol Iman uh, from the National Public Library. Uh, Carrie Gleason from The Nature of Things. Uh, her family also owns a piece of property at 57 Factory Street, uh, which they're working to develop a project at. Uh, Alderman Tom Lopez um, and James Veo, uh, the Economic uh, Development Downtown Specialist, uh, is also on our board. Um, Tom and James were both nominated to the board um, prior to their current roles, uh, but we were very happy to have them. Uh, they are downtown enthusiasts through and through. All right, new staff team. Uh, so I had mentioned earlier, Ben, uh, we, we in 2015, had a staff of myself, um, one part-time person for 10 hours per week. Um, in 2016, we grew that a good bit. Um, we have hired Ben Rudick as our arts coordinator. Uh, he works 20 hours per week, 
uh, developing some of the uh, music and arts programming. Uh, he's done a lot of work with the piano program this year uh, and a, a whole lot of work um, developing the music festival series. Um, he's also been an integral part of uh, reviewing the concept of a music hall at the uh, Central Fire Station, uh, which is still in development. Uh, the marketing coordinator, uh, Carolyn Wally, uh, she was a UNH business student, still is, but she uh, was an intern with us, um, and we've hired her to come on uh, for uh, 12 hours a week. Uh, marketing intern, Crystal Lee Cobb. Uh, in this past year, we also hired two staff members um, as part of the execution of the uh, Farmer's Market Promotion Program grant to help get our EBT system up and running uh, and to help facilitate the growth of the market. Um, and so we brought on Jen Miller as our market day coordinator um, and downtown steward Basil Mansfield, um, who assisted with the setup and breakdown of the farmer's market, uh, but also uh, with the monitoring of the uh, street pianos and, and a variety of other uh, amenities that we manage. Um, so the audience, the downtowner, um, over this past year, um, in, in, we've grown it a good bit, uh, about 1,100. A, a um, Facebook has grown significantly. Um, our following has gone from 4,500 up to over 7,000. Um, we've also grown a good bit on Twitter and Instagram, um, but those are not really our primary, um, our primary uh, social media mediums. Yes? How much of your Facebook growth is directly attributed to Pokemon? Um, I, I would say that not a lot of it. Um, th there was a lot of activity, uh, but I, I don't know if our number of followers are uh, attributed to, to Pokemon. I, I, if anything, I would attribute it to content that people think is of value, but uh, that we pay to promote. Um, so we have, uh, over the past two years, um, I have reallocated uh, funding for staffing towards marketing. Uh, I didn't feel that we were doing enough, um, and we had some work to do with regard to perception um, of downtown and, and getting folks to realize um, you know, how vibrant and active it already is to help uh, catalyze that further. Um, so a, a good bit of our growth on social media is, is directly attributed to paid advertising as well. Um, uh, this past year, uh, we rolled out a brand new uh, website, uh, downtownnashua.org. Um, we have a new look. Uh, we have a new uh, layout as far as organization goes, centered around the Eat, Shop, Live Local. Um, there is a, a good focus on downtown living. Um, and so um, we have added a central calendar. Uh, we now have a calendar that automatically aggregates content from over 60 calendars of community organizations, um, as well as um, city meetings, uh, the National Public Library, um, a, a whole host of groups. Uh, we have their content from their calendar pulled on a daily basis and brought into this calendar. Uh, this is a new functionality, um, and we've also added a, a good bit of focus on cultural groups. Um, so the um, art tour, uh, interactive GIS map that the GIS department has built. Uh, we've embedded that into our cultural page. Uh, we've got links for a variety of different organizations that have programming downtown on that page as well. Um, and then a focus on local. Um, so the local section is, is centered around three things. Uh, they are the Nashua Farmers Market, um, the uh, Eat Local Fall Food Festival slash Farmers Dinner, um, and the um, Gate City Community Gardens. So that's kind of all uh, one, one set of programs in the way that we present it. Uh, this website um, has generally received, on average, about 200 to 250 visits a week, uh, which is fairly good. Um, they, are, they are live folks. It's not um, uh, bots kind of crawling the site. Um, during the winter holiday stroll, we actually had to upgrade our servers this year uh, twice. Uh, we had to go up two tiers uh, because over the course of two days, we had about 8,000 visits to the website, and that activity um, crashed the site the morning of the stroll. Um, so I was running around getting the winter holiday stroll ready and uh, on the phone with GoDaddy trying to get our site back up, uh, which I, I, that, that was something I was very happy to have a problem with, though. 
Um, this site also ties into our newsletter. Uh, there, there's a pop-up. Uh, going to be working to um, um, going to be working to have the behavior of that be a little more nuanced. Uh, some folks have felt that they're not a big fan of the pop-up, but at the same time, we get about t 15 to 20 new signups to the newsletter a week, um, just based off of um, uh, website visits. Uh, with the music festival coming up, and then with the advertising associated with that, uh, we have uh, gone from 200 to 250 visits per week, um, up to uh, about 150 um, uh, 150 to 250 a day on any given day over the past two to three weeks, uh, which is exciting to see. Um, so this is the new central car calendar. Um, it's not very impressive, looks like a calendar, um, but when you're actually on the site, you can go through, um, you can search based on event type, uh, organizer, um, is it a free event, um, and we've kind of gone through a lot of this information already. All right, we've already touched on the fact that we will be growing the Nashua Street Pianos program uh, to a total of three pianos. Uh, the Gate City Community Gardens uh, project has expanded. Uh, we will be adding 12 additional garden beds on the April 22nd um, Nashua Pride Downtown Parks Cleanup Day, which is exciting. Uh, that's thanks large, uh, largely due to a donation from New Sky Productions, uh, who uh, conducts a, uh, uh, they participate in a program called 1% for the Environment, uh, where they, they donate 1% of their um, uh, gross sales uh, to support environmental causes, uh, which has been a boon for the Community Garden Project. Um, this past fall, we built the fencing um, out there um, in partnership with the United Way, uh, and we'll be uh, building that up and uh, creating more opportunities for gardening along the Nashua Heritage Rail Trail um, in the Tree Streets neighborhood, which is exciting. Um, yes, Alderman Lopez. Just for people who are watching in the audience, can you tell them how to contact if they want to sign up for a bed and how much they'll cost? Yep. Yeah, so the, uh, the bed fee uh, is $35. Uh, they can sign up uh, by contacting us either through Facebook um, or through uh, email, which can be found on the website. Uh, they can contact me directly if, if they would like. Um, all of that stuff comes through me anyway. So uh, my email address is paulwshea at downtownnashua.org. Uh, on the application uh, for the, uh, the community garden, uh, there's also a section where you can check it off um, that says, you know, I'd, I'd really like to garden, but don't have the financial ability to pay for the fee. Um, if someone checks that off, we don't ask any questions. Um, we just invite them to join us um, because part of the, the goal of that um, is to get more folks from the neighborhood um, engaged with one another um, and with the, uh, you know, with the maintenance and betterment of our public spaces. Um, and, and so we don't want... Uh, ability to pay to dissuade anybody from how that, um, you know, whether or not they're able to participate. Um, the Nashua Farmers Market will continue to grow. Uh, we are very excited uh, to share that we have Miles Smith Farm joining us. Um, they do uh, beef and pork products, um, and they will, they have a CSA, uh, a protein CSA, um, and they'll be joining us on Sundays at the market, uh, which is very exciting. That's one of the few remaining things that I've been trying to to bring into the market is some meats. Um, yep. Yeah. And then now, now I've just got to get the cheeses. So if we can get the, we get the meats, if we can get the cheeses, we'll be in we'll be in tip top shape. Um, just not if you eat too many meats and cheeses. All right. So growing in 2017, this is not our event, but I am very excited to share that the Nashua Telegraph has moved downtown. Uh, we are partnering with them on events, um, you know, wherever possible. Um, they have conducted an event um, uh, for a number of years called Motor Mania out in Hudson. Um, the Motor Mania event, um, they, they've got over 100 classic cars that come out for that, lots of folks. Um, and so uh, sometime in June, uh, we are working with them to um, uh, make this possible in downtown Nashua. Um, yeah, it's it's very exciting. You know, a car show is something that a lot of folks have been asking for. Uh, they they think it's a great idea. Uh, not exactly the lowest hanging fruit um, for, for for me anyway. So, 
um, I'm, I'm very pleased that they are they are doing this. I think it will bring a lot of excitement. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if over a thousand folks come out to downtown, uh, which can have a very real um, economic impact. But uh, all that, it's it's just fun. Um, uh, James Veo in economic development has worked with us to develop a um, kind of a layout for uh, how these vehicles will be best placed, so I really appreciate that. Um, and we've helped the Telegraph um, uh, become accustomed to the city permitting process um, as they have operated at a, a swath of land in Hudson for some time. Um, the, the, the permitting process is not exactly, um, you know, for these larger events, is not exactly something that they've been to up on. Yes, sir. I, I have to ask, did James recommend reverse angle parking or for front end? Um, the, I believe the image shows the vehicles parked in a variety of reverse and head in angles. Okay, so nothing there. Yeah, yeah. Um, we love that back end angled parking though. Um, so this is exciting. Um, so we appreciate that they are enthused about this um, and, and whatever we can do uh, to facilitate other organizations producing events downtown uh, that, that contribute to vibrancy, we are very happy to do. All right, so new for 2017. Um, also, um, the last five years, uh, we are producing our first piece of musical theater, uh, which is very exciting. Um, I, I personally have been involved with a number of productions uh, with actor singers and stagecoach productions. Um, I also serve on the board for Peacock Players. Um, I have been contacted by a group of um, a group of folks uh, who are interested in uh, in bringing a two person production uh, to Nashua. The two person production isn't really something that fits the model for a lot of our current community theater organizations. Um, ticket sales, engagement, uh, a lot of these things are driven by the cast size. Um, and so for uh, organizations like Actor Singers who are trying to sell out Keefe Auditorium, which is a very, you know, sizable venue, uh, for, um, you know, folks like uh, Stagecoach Productions who are a smaller uh, uh, production house, Nashua Theater Guild, um, you know, having a large cast just, you know, it, it brings more hands, lighter work, and more folks to come out to see their friends and family perform. So this wouldn't fit the mold for uh, our established community theater organizations. And so they, they said, hey, you know, we, we were looking at this license and um, we need an organization that can actually obtain it. Would you be open to that? Um, and so we are very pleased to do that. Um, the last five years uh, as a piece of musical theater, uh, the story explores a five-year relationship between Jamie Wellerstein uh, rising novelist, and Kathy Hyatt, a struggling actress. Uh, the show uses a form of storytelling in which Kathy's story is told in reverse chronological order, uh, beginning uh, at the beginning of the show and at the end of the marriage. Um, and Jamie's uh, is told in chronological order, starting just after the, couple's, uh, the couple has first met. Uh, the characters do not directly interact except for a wedding song in the middle um, as their timelines intersect. Um, so it should be very interesting. Um, they have uh, put up uh, funding to secure the license, um, and so this will be a, a kind of a, a zero-sum uh, operation financially. Uh, but we are hoping to uh, draw a couple hundred folks down over the course of that weekend uh, for this production. Um, you know, having an organization like Great American Downtown in the community to facilitate these projects um, that require an organizational structure um, but would not necessarily be well suited to being their own organization um, is is great. I mean, we, we are happy to do that. So if there are folks at home that are interested in doing something um, and they'd like to, to kind of pitch it to us and partner with us, um, you know, we, we are very open to that. Um, also new for 2017, um, music festival series. Um, the, we conducted a survey over the course of a month uh, that had about 300 respondents, and we asked folks what they'd like to see grow and develop over the next three years in downtown Nashua. The number one thing on the list without question is uh, more uh, an increase in indoor and outdoor 
music um, programs. Um, it, by uh, I think that one had like 130 votes, and I think the next one down had about 80. Um, so that was it, it was a standout. Um, so we um, have worked to develop this series. Uh, the New Muse Festival uh, is an eclectic array of genre-bending artists from the National Circuit. Um, this event, uh, we are uh, glad to uh, have the recommendation of the Downtown Improvement Committee to support seed funding for this event, uh, similarly to how the fall event was uh, supported in its um, infancy last year. Um, this event will coincide with the rollout of the street pianos. Um, it was uh, a adaptation of the Sights and Sounds Spring Arts Festival last year. Um, last year, one of the things, though that name was fun, um, it's been used. Uh, someone else has already, ha they have a Sights and Sounds Festival in Alabama or somewhere. Um, and so to avoid confusion, um, we, have, uh, we have kind of re, we've gone back to the drawing board on this concept. Um, we are actually going to, um, as opposed to conducting it in Renaissance Park, uh, we are looking to uh, kind of standardize a closure uh, between Pearl and Temple Street. Um, that is about, uh, you know, it's about two blocks-ish. Uh, you've got High Street through the middle there. Um, this closure also creates the opportunity for traffic to circulate uh, without too, too much difficulty. Um, due to the way that the, the streets flow. Uh, so we're looking to standardize that so that way we can have an established um, approach to this um, and make it easier for uh, you know all, all the folks that are involved uh, with the closure, including the police and DPW. Um, uh, the same closure we would seek to use um, for the, uh, the car show uh, with the Nashua Telegraph. Um, so the New Muse Festival uh, is taking place on May 6th. Uh, the uh, piano rollout starts at uh, 10, um, I believe around noontime. Um, Art Ventures uh, through City Arts Nashua is conducting a program called Comeback Kitchen Table, uh, which is a, a set of uh, community uh, decorated uh, kitchen tables, which will demonstrate um, the challenges that the uh, American family faces in the 21st century. Uh, with regard to technology and all of our life's distractions um, to remind us of the value of sitting down at the kitchen table for a conversation and a meal uh, without your gadget. Um, so that that's exciting. Uh, we will also have an arts market. Uh, we're going to have several food trucks there. Uh, we are also, uh, due to uh, the interest of the community, we have uh, raised two additional um, satellite stages for this event. So not only will we have a main stage on Main Street uh, with music going from 1 p.m. all the way to 10 p.m., uh, but we will also have a rock stage um, along the, um, uh, the I, think it's, uh, I think you'd call it an egress, behind Riverside Barbecue um, through the parking lot in the pathway there. Uh, there will be a stage set up out there that will feature local rock bands with original music. Uh, the gazebo at the um, uh, at Railroad Square, uh, the Duchesne Oval. Uh, we will have programming there as well, some more easy listening. Um, earlier in the day, we have a children's performer. Uh, folks can find out more about that event, uh, downtownnashua.org slash new muse, which is N-U-M-U-S-E. Um, and there's playlists for folks to listen to uh, featuring main stage artists, uh, music videos, information, um, and then uh, once the application period closes for our arts market, uh, we'll also update that information there so people can have an idea of uh, what will be available for, for crafts and art products. Um, it should be a very exciting day. Uh, we are hoping that we will be able to attract uh, as many as two to 3,000 to downtown for that day, uh, but I, I feel confident that we'll have at least 1,000 folks that come out um, in the first year to to check this thing out. Uh, the Gate City Battle of the Bands. Uh, so, so the New Muse Festival, the kind of uh, focus area uh, is about 25 to 40. Um, there are certainly folks um, on the lower side of that range and above that range that will enjoy the event, uh, but that's the target audience. The Gate City Battle of the Bands. Uh, we wanted to have at least one music festival that was very uh, heavy into the local music scene. 
Um, we have actually, uh, since uh, this presentation, we have uh, reevaluated the naming of this event, um, and it will be called the Merrimack Valley Battle of the Bands. Uh, we're going to seek uh, to reach out to folks uh, as far north as Concord um, and down through the Massachusetts leg of the Merrimack Valley um, to draw from a broader uh, talent pool. Um, but this event uh, will have a total of uh, 12 bands competing uh, for a professional album recording. Um, and there'll be an a application period during the month of May. Uh, during the month of June, there will be a period for uh, online elimination. So folks will go and, and vote to support the bands they want to see there uh, to narrow the field, um, as well as to hone in on, on the most talented and, and well-followed bands from the local music scene. Um, and then in July, uh, the the bands will compete uh, before a, a judge, a, a group of judges rather, um, and then they will they'll get an album recording. Um, not a record deal, an album recording, um, but this event is more geared towards uh, 18 to 30. Um, a lot of the the younger folks that have uh, bands and and perform and are trying to, um, you know, build some excitement around their art. Uh, the New England Roots Festival uh, will be September 30th. Um, that's an adaptation of the Fall Music Festival from last year. Uh, we've kind of honed in on, on the brand of this. Uh, we are seeking to attract folks uh, from throughout the, the broader region, you know, a, a 30 to 40 mile radius. Um, and this event will be supported by the River Casino and Sports Bar, uh, which is very exciting. Um, they have opened a facility over on... Um, on the high street um, by where Arena used to be. Um, so it's one of the charitable gaming um, spaces in town. Uh, this event uh, will also take place on Main Street, uh, dialing back just a little bit. The Gate City Battle of the Bands is a lower budget music event. Um, so this event will not likely take place on Main Street. Um, there, there's a good uh, number of costs associated with the closure of Main Street, um, which, which we're happy to pay. Um, uh, you know, as long as we can bring the sponsors in to support them moving forward. But um, the Gate City Battle of Vans, because it's a lower budget event, uh, we're looking to hold it in Railroad Square. Um, however, um, there is some concern, some life safety concern uh, with the Leighton House. There is a high frequency of calls there. Um, and so uh, we have been asked to carefully evaluate uh, the way in which we do that. Um, and to be sensitive to the fact that it may not be feasible to host the event in, in a closed railroad square um, due to those life safety concerns. Um, moving forward, uh, the New England Roots Festival event uh, will take place on Main Street as well um, and should feature, uh, will feature um, Americana, folk, rhythm and blues, reggae, um, general um, American roots genres. Um, the target audience for that event uh, is, is skewing higher um, to 35 uh, to, to up. Um, and that should be another exciting event. Uh, and we're hoping to have that be a big draw as well. All right, so volunteer recognition. Um, we've got Crystal Lee Cobb, who's been an intern with us. Um, Celine Blaze, uh, Winter Blaze, Kevin O'Meara, Mike Watt, Ethan Smith, Brandon Jones, uh, Brandon Lee, and Nick Jones um, have all done over 100 hours of volunteer rec uh, volunteering um, this past year. Uh, a couple of them, I'd, I'd say Mike and Ethan and Crystal, have gone over the, the 250 mark uh, easily. Um, Brandon and Nick uh, are honor students from, from Nashua High. Uh, they came to us uh, last year, uh, and they said, "Hey, you know, we we've got these service hours, but we don't want to, we don't want to just go someplace and volunteer for them for a little while. We like want to do our own project. Can <laughs> you help us do that?" Um, and so, I sat with them and reviewed their project ideas. They they've got a number of good ideas. Uh, one of the ideas uh, that that seemed most feasible uh, was a uh, set of inspirational quotes. Um, on steps. Um, so they, they saw this idea somewhere, they really liked it, they wanted to do it in Nashua. Um, they thought that doing this at the public library would work well, um, and they'd do literary quotes. Um, so if you're coming up the back stairs from the library walk, 
um, up to that kind of um, little round um, paved area. Um, on those steps is a set of stenciled quotes. Um, so Dr. Seuss quotes and um, um, just kind of inspirational slash literary quotes. Um, so they were very proud of that, um, and, and you know, I'm very, very glad that they did that. Um, uh, I think it was Tom. Was it Rick who helped them out with that? Yeah. So Rick. I was surprised I didn't see him on the volunteer list, actually. Oh, uh, right on. Um, oh yeah. I'm gonna have to apologize to Rick personally. No, I, I, I owe Rick Everhard a uh, a, a bit of recognition. Um, he did a good bit with uh, supporting the Nashua Farmers Market this past year. Uh, he came out most every week to help out with that. So Rick should certainly be on my list. Uh, but Rick also helped Brandon and Nick with their project. Um, so we, we appreciate that. All right. So uh, on the business side, um, you know, the past two years have, have highlighted a number of the businesses that have either grown um, or, or come into town. Um, the River Casino and Sports Bar, uh, the Flight Center, uh, Ace Hardware, Terra Salon, Snap It's Vintage, Tangled Roots Herbal, Nashua Hub, The Vanity Room, New Taj India, The Thirsty Turtle, Graffiti Paint Bar, which is going into the Yogurt and Love location, uh, Aerial Moon, uh, The Fit Furnace, Milliard Brewery, Riverside Barbecue has grown significantly um, into the entire building there um, down by the Main Street Bridge. Uh, we've, we've had a good number of other businesses, Nashua Shoe Repair. Uh, there are also two um, clothing shops that are coming in, one on, I think they're both on Pearl Street, East and West Pearl Street. Um, so we, we've had a good number of businesses come in, which is really exciting. Um, you know, I, I, of these, I'm, I'm pleased to see them all come in, but Graffiti Paint Bar is a business that has operated up on Amherst Street um, near uh, down Cellular Drive. Um, and they are moving downtown. Um, so they've been up on the retail corridor. They said, you know what, we are a unique business. We want to stand out. Uh, we are hip, and we're doing this cool thing. We want to be with, you know, with company that is like that. And so um, they have uh, chosen to come downtown after operating up there for a number of years. Um, we've got a number of new housing projects that are coming online. Uh, the Bridge Street Project, which is uh, roughly 152 units. Um, they have uh, started building structure over there, which is exciting to see. That's been a long time in the making. Uh, the Franklin Street Building, um, I, I've heard uh, that they may be up as high as many as uh, 190 units uh, when that whole thing is done. Uh, sound about right? Uh, so, but at least 170 units over there. Uh, the Marshall Street Project, uh, back behind the Southern New Hampshire campus um, is bringing in 155 units. Um, and the, string, the Spring Street RFP, I believe, just closed. Um, so we are excited to see what comes of that. Uh, the, the economic development has been conducting that. Um, and so that should be interesting. Um, it's not Spring Street, it's School Street. The School Street RFP. <laughs> Um, I'm like spring. No, that ain't right. Um, all right. So uh, the Performing Arts Center study, uh, which I believe uh, is, is coming into its, its uh, coming into the finish here, uh, sometime in perhaps May, there'll be a, a presentation on that, which is exciting. Um, so lo lots of things to be thankful for. Uh, lots of things to look forward to. All right. Questions. Alderman the first. Uh, is the downtown trolley going to be running again this summer? Uh, it depends. I think that's pending funding. Um, I don't. I don't know what the status of that is. Uh, I know that the downtown improvement committee voted to support a certain portion of that. Um, I also know that uh, they are working to demonstrate ridership uh, to seek federal funding uh, for that um, I increase in service. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, on the status as far as uh, beyond. Um, uh, the the first quarter this year goes. What's going on with districts? Districts. So we are reevaluating districts, um, and districts was a beta test uh, which we participated in, um, and we got about a hundred, uh, not a hundred. We got about seventy two businesses to sign on. Uh, give or take five. Um, the businesses, um, 
uh, stop generating content in the app um, at about the same time as the um, the beta phase was kind of rolling out. Um, I've explained to the company that is working to build this app, uh, which, which just got a, a very big update, um, that without the value demonstrated to our businesses that were engaged in it over the course of the beta period, um, it would be very difficult for me to compel a critical mass of uh, businesses to participate enough so that there would be content that people would be interested and we should highlight it. Um, if you go into the app now, uh, you will see that um, all of the um, users that did not convert over to paid after the free beta period have been dropped. Um, they still show up on the map as a pin uh, with very little information. Um, and there are perhaps four or five businesses that have uh, maintained a subscription. It's very modest. Uh, it's ten dollars a month, but you know, if you think that the app is dirt, dirt's not worth ten dollars a month to you. That being said, um, I am very pleased with the update to the app. Um, I have um, uh, gone back and forth with the company a couple of times, uh, trying to compel them to um, uh, give us another trial, um, and they have finally agreed to do that um, after uh, some lengthy discussions. So we have just gotten a code uh, for our retailers and our, our restaurants to use uh, for another six-month trial period. Um, so we are going to be working, uh, uh, Carolyn and Crystal are going to be working uh, with uh, downtown businesses to get them to repopulate content, uh, to re-engage them. Uh, it is my belief that with a, a free trial period um, and with um, a, a, you know, a double down of efforts to bring folks on as users of the app and also make sure that our businesses are putting good content on there, um, that it's possible that it could still take. Um, so we're going to give it one last honest try, um, and, and we'll see what comes of that. I know every time I come here, it tells me, welcome to downtown Nashua, but that's the extent of it. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's probably all you get. Um, no, we're, we're going to work on it. I'm, I'm hoping it takes, <coughs> but, but we'll see. Is there some, do we know of some other equivalent app that might be more appropriate? Um, I, I want to say there's, no, that might be more appropriate, no. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a number of people that are trying to do what they're trying to do. Um, none of them are any more robust than the original beta was. Um, I, I think that this new setup, um, is, is it, it's, it looks good. It looks really good. The user interface is nice, um, and, it, and it's got some real potential. On the longer term, um, of course, everything costs money, but this would cost money. On the longer term, we have the ability uh, within the app to set up uh, custom, customized application features. Uh, for example, uh, someone could program into the application a, um, a, a self-guided audio tour um, that you could um, um, opt into. Um, and so when you're on this self-guided audio tour, you have a little map. It shows you where you are on the map. You walk to one of the pins, um, say it's a tour um, that almost mimics the, uh, the GIS um, art tour map. Um, when someone arrives at that site, um, either through a, a very small geofence or through a Bluetooth uh, iBeacon, um, it could trigger the app to give a, um, um, an audio presentation. So that audio presentation, what I have in my mind is, is a cool idea would be if we could get all of the artists for these works um, to do a brief description of their inspiration um, and have a little photo pop up of, of the artwork so that you make sure that you know what you're looking at, you know, you're looking at the right thing. Um, I think that would be really cool. I think that would also increase uh, folks' general engagement with the app and then some of the, the taking advantage of the offers and things that are within the app could be uh, catalyzed a little further. Um, but they're looking for, I think, $200 a, a location to set up that, that custom feature. Um, so if we had, uh, you know, if we used both the sculptures and the murals, um, we're looking at like an $8,000 investment. So I, 
Yes. If you find the $8,000, I will graciously surrender my several mural tour participants every year. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, so we're going to keep working with that. Um, it's, it's got, I still think it has potential. Alderman Clements, please. I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm very impressed with everything. Um, Thank you. I, as I have been since you've taken over the position. Um, I think, you know, <clears throat> Great American Downtown has only gotten better uh, in the in the last few years that you've um, been at the helm. And I have to say that, um, uh, you know, its future is, is very bright. Um, you do a great job. I think the things that <clears throat> with the music festivals trying to reach out to a broader than just the Nashua area, but, you know, the Merrimack Valley or all of New England, things like that, is an awesome uh, <clears throat> thing to do. I, I believe that Nashua can become uh, a destination, particularly around the arts and music, uh, things like, uh, like that. Um, and the market and the focus on marketing, I think is, is, is key. Um, it's something that, you know, we, this city has been lacking for forever. And, uh, the fact that, you know, there's an organization that's putting money into that, I think is, is great. Um, so all I would say is, you know, keep up the good work and, uh, and, you know, you, you certainly have my support. Thank you very much. Uh, it, I really appreciate all that. Um, it's it's worth noting that for the past two years we have um, we have taken staffing funding and put it into marketing. Um, this past year, I have dialed that back a bit so that we can start uh, amping up the staffing. Um, but I, I think that um, perception uh, and awareness of what's good about downtown and that downtown is good. Driving that is so incredibly important. Uh, perception is one of, it, in my view, uh, one of the one of the greater challenges that we've got. Mm -hmm. uh, but w but we've made a lot of headway. Alderman Lopez, I think that uh, all of the activities and events and um, promotion that you're doing really complements the investment the city made in the downtown sidewalks and and mm -hmm. infrastructure improvements, the lighting, um, and that having people use the space really brings that value out. Um, so I want to thank you too, as the, the downtown, the alderman for the Ward Four downtown, um, and I want to encourage you to continue finding ways to get people to use that space. Um, I th I'm sure you're already working on on ways to do it, but I would also encourage you to think about the east and the west directions too. Um, you start. We started a, a, an interesting step with the uh, the oval, the courthouse oval but that space isn't really connected with anything downtown. Um, there's a lot of really um, energetic businesses on West Hollis and on uh, West Pearl that, again, could use a little bit more direct connection with downtown. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the Main Street uh, Sidewalks program has certainly been a, a, a positive, uh, and it will continue to be so uh, on the long term. Um, the more that we can do to to connect the built environment um, of of downtown's core, kind of like that that Main Street and One Street back, um, building out the built environment and doing that with it, which is within all of our you know individual um, areas of expertise and and power and influence to enhance uh, those. Uh, places further back, I, I think will only be of benefit to that core. Um, it's, it's my view uh, that the quality of life and perception of our downtown neighborhoods is inextricably tied to, um, to the, the performance uh, on an economic level um, of, of that core. So um, I, I, I appreciate that and we, I certainly will continue to work on that stuff. Well, I would just like to thank you um, for being available on such short notice. Um, Paul and I talked about this after he gave the presentation at the annual meeting, so I'm glad we were able to make it work. And um, I think certainly anyone watching and seeing the diversity of events and activities and, and how things have grown, um, if they're not aware of what were, what was going on downtown, um, they should certainly now see there's um, much more there. And I think 
one of the really great things about it is we're bringing people into downtown who, as Alderman Clemens said, may have never come down here before. It was like, oh yeah, it's the stroll, it's the taste of downtown, you know, it's those four or five major things. And um, I think by increasing the um, variety of activities, and as Alderman Clemens said, the, the range um, from which you're drawing um, people to participate is certainly a boon for all of us. So um, thank you to you and your board because um, certainly it helps to have a board and an executive director all working in the same direction. So thank you thank to you them um, for their continued support of downtown. I have two quick questions for you. What is the date for this year's taste? I didn't see it. Uh, it is June 7th. Okay, that's what I thought. And um, the Wednesday Farmers Market, are people able to use the SNAP program there also? They are able to use the SNAP. If they get SNAP tokens at the Sunday market, okay. um, they are able to use them at the Wednesday market. Okay, that's what I thought, that there was an arrangement that if you bought them on Sunday, you could use them on yes. Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, the, the challenge is that it um, takes somebody to sit there through the right. duration of the market, um, and, and we it's just not feasible to have a staff person um, in, or, or myself there. Yeah, no, uh, and I, I just, I think it's important for people to know that there is a way, again, if you have a small refrigerator or, you know, you don't want to, you don't think you can buy everything on Saturday, and because you do kind of get two for one with your SNAP benefits, that if you purchase enough in advance on Sunday, you can use them on Wednesday, so... Thank you. Alderman Clemens. Yeah, I wanted to uh, mention, and I don't know um, what the feasibility of this would be, but I figured I'd throw it out there anyway. Certainly a, a, a big um, venue that's not used in the wintertime would be Holman Stadium for a, uh, <clears throat> you know, a market. Um, I don't know where within the stadium there's the, you know, where it's heated and things like that. Um, but it might be worth looking into only because it's, it's a facility that's really not used mm -hmm. in the winter time. So you wouldn't have that conflict that you mentioned um, with facilities that are trying to be used year round. So um, it's also on the bus route too. Uh, so folks could, could get there. So just throwing that out there as a, as a suggestion. Thank you. I, I will, uh, float that to NRPC so that they can take a look at it. Great. Any other comments, questions? Well, thank you. I, I want to thank you guys very, very much for having me. Um, and, and thank you, Alderwoman Melissa Goya, for inviting me this evening. Um, you know, I, I just want to say um, we really, really appreciate the support of the City of Nashua and the Board of Aldermen, uh, particularly uh, with regard to, to um, seeding things uh, and giving us the opportunity to try something out, demonstrate that it works, and um, and prove value. Um, so so thank you for all that you do, um, and, and the confidence that that you have in us to to execute our mission. Well, thank you. So um, we have some more business. So just. Feel free if you would like to stay here or go home, which... I'm going to go home and see my wife. <laughs> there you go. Uh, thank you guys very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so... Oh, um, can, I, can I give you... I just want to give you collateral, um, if, if you don't mind. It was uh, just a mailer that we did uh, for the farmer's market just to show you kind of some of the product that the NRPC oh, sure. helped us put together. Thank you. Do you have an extra one? I can... I'll include it with the minutes mm. for this meeting. Thank you. Yeah, leave one. Thank you. I'll make sure every alderman gets one. This is great. Karen? I have a thousand more. They were extras from the run. Oh, um, great. And so if, if you, if, if you know of a social service agency or uh, doctor's office or someplace, let me know, because um, I've, I've got a big old box of them uh, back at the office. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Alderman Lopez. Um, will there be a copy of that presentation available for the minutes? Oh, are you, is it possible for you to send it to um Yeah, would you like Lover? it as a, a PDF? Yeah, that's yeah. probably the yep. easiest. Can we yeah. make it blink? Make sure it blinks. <laughs> Just <laughs> blink in time with it, yeah. <laughs> 
I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Try real I think hard. I need to use flash for that. <laughs> Tough room. <laughs> Paul, thank you. And on that note, I hope you will come back and join us. <laughs> well, Any, he, because I want to read it. He, he's going to ask for blinking lights, lights for yes. uh, a holiday yeah. outside. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that was all about. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Um, so moving on with our agenda. Communication, we have none. Unfinished business, we have none. New... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped discussion. We have, um, you received the draft notes from Strategic um, Planning Committee, and it looks like this. Mm -hmm. And um, every group that has a representative on that committee was asked to do a ranking, and um, if you thought there were some of these areas that could maybe be rolled in together to give us that feedback. So um, I was glad we were able to have this meeting because I really didn't want to speak for the committee in putting this together. So I didn't know what thoughts people had about um, like maybe top five priorities. Um, education, public safety, long-term financial planning, efficiency, HR and labor, library, natural resources, complete streets, land use, economic development, infrastructure, public transportation, downtown, and city arts and cultures, and culture, I'm sorry, it was the, um, those were the broad areas that were, um, that were identified. Um, with more items under some than others, but um, not to indicate that that impacts the importance. So, yes, Alderman Lopez. I just really would like to see um, attention given to the Complete Streets Initiative because I feel like with a lot of the city design and planning, we're leaving a lot of our population on the table if we don't consider the impacts of pedestrians, especially with an increasingly large elderly population and an increasingly urban population, which isn't just people who use a car to get around. They use multiple modes of transportation. I think it's important for us to integrate that into our plans and really have that plan for it. And I would just, um, <clears throat> to your comments, um, it, under complete streets, there are, actually, there are two items. And again, not to say that this is not an important area. Um, one is um, a walkable um, walkable and a bike plan, and then the other one is walkability across the city. So not just looking at the downtown area, but looking at some of our other areas where we have um, density of population and people wanting to walk to get access to other things. So Alderman Clements. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's definitely more challenging uh, in the in the winter time. Um, you know just because of the the snow and and then the the last couple storms with how heavy the snow <coughs> been, um, presents a unique challenge so um but i i i agree i think um I, you know i think what well, if we can do stuff to make it better uh access for pedestrians and 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 bikes i think that's a good thing um um just we just have to keep in mind the um the snow and what I would like to do um, with any plan like that is figure out a way that how we just to make sure that it's you know that we put the winter thought into whatever process um, that is moving forward so that we don't end up with a bike path or a pedestrian walkway that ends up because of where it's located ends up being plowed with snow and you know there's a right three foot bank of snow there for the whole time and yeah. it's kind of like well what was the point so that, that that'd be my only thought um with that but i agree with alderman lopez that it's something that needs to be thought out okay any other thoughts about rankings um alderman lopez i just think alderman um clemens just outlined my point exactly what i was thinking of is we have a great infrastructure opportunity for people who are walking or, or biking in the rail trail, but we didn't consider how we would plow it. So there's mm -hmm. nothing 
well, in the last several storms, a new strategy has come about, which has made it much better. But without that specific attention given to it, we have a, a path that goes east-west. But since the plowing is is focused on the roads, you're literally putting barriers up every at every intersection where you have snowbanks. So mm -hmm. that kind of planning and organization traps pockets of populations that could be enhancing our, 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 our downtown and other infrastructure and could be taking care of their own needs when they really need to and traveling more safely in a corridor that was meant for them than having a great bike path that no one can use so everybody's walking down West Hollis. Yep. Or Spitbrook. Or down to <laughs> Daniel Webster. Yeah. yeah, and it begs the question because, you know, I know that the city, it, from what from what I understand and, and Alderman McCarthy if you know differently please correct me but from what I understand is we do hire private contractors um, to plow snow so I don't understand why we couldn't do have a private contractor hired to do the sidewalks um, and get the areas where you know some of our city workers can't get to because they don't have the time or or the resources so yeah uh, so there's a couple of problems with with removal in town i think they're all surmountable it's just we're we're new at this um we have two different divisions one is cleaning the sidewalks and one is actually transporting snow so the, the we have um i i mean i pointed this out a couple of months ago when when I saw a huge snowbank on one of the corners. And it turns out that, you know, that is our normal way to do it is what should happen is the snow on the sidewalks gets pushed out to where it's easily accessible at the corners. <coughs> However, at that particular moment, it's blocking the crosswalks on both streets. And then very proximate to that, Public Works is supposed to come and pick it up. We're missing that coordination. And the, the real issue there is our strategy on snow has always been figure a place to put it until it melts in place you and i think we've come to the conclusion we can't do that downtown we actually have to remove it from downtown and let it melt somewhere else mm -hmm. and that's uh, one that takes more resources we're gonna have to figure that out and two <coughs> we got to learn to coordinate that and we have to learn to coordinate it numerous times per winter and get it right each time so that we don't have the problems with the big banks of snow well, I mean, I have to say, I, you know, and I, and I expressed this frustration at, at a finance meeting, um, or, you know, earlier, after not this storm, but the previous storm. My street, <clears throat> now granted, I live on a dead end. Um, I live on the dead end part, portion of Ash Street. But, you know, it wasn't touched at all until I called. Uh, and I called at nine o'clock at night, um, and the snowstorm had been done, and done and gone. And when I say it hadn't been touched, I mean no plow had gone down the street. Um, the, you know, I had probably five or six constituents call me throughout the day. Similar situations. One street didn't get plowed till three in the morning, um, and so. You know, that's something that we need to work on um, for sure, uh, just in general, because there should not be a snowstorm where any street gets left until the end of the storm. And the reason being is that it's a safety hazard. You have to have at least, you know, a, a swipe through every now and then so that a fire truck or an ambulance, an ambulance actually in, the, in one of those storms got stuck. Um, and you know, that's not the situation that we want happening. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, that needs to be addressed uh, as something that's a priority for next year because um, I, I have to tell you, the way that they did it uh, this year was, was completely unacceptable. Um, if you're doing a whole neighborhood and, you know, I can see the cross street from my house and you'd see the plows go by, you'd see them go up the other portion of the street it, it's like, come on, guys, just take a swipe down, you know. And not to say that, I mean, th those guys work tremendous hours. They do, uh, you know, a great job. Um, but just a little bit of tweaking to that plan so that they touch every street, I think, would, would go a long way. 
Alderman Lopez. I think the, con the complete streets um, rates the needs in that area. Um, but I had asked uh, um, Director Marchant whether it had been done in the winter, and it kind of didn't reference the winter. It was done in the, the summer, if I remember. Um, but another element that I would like to see factored into the planning is where the population densities are. Um, I know from personal observation, a large part of downtown was very nicely cleared to the pavement all the way down and was gone over several times, but they had not yet done a section over by 243 Main Street where people with mobility issues were up there and mm. they couldn't get out of their, their door. They couldn't get food. Uh, they couldn't get medications. They, they were trapped. So I think attention needs to be given to where the, the population density is. And I agree with Alderman Clemens that there shouldn't be any area that isn't touched at all. Uh, but I think this year it seemed like there was no shortage of hard work by DPW. It was just the, the strategy really needs to be tuned a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, Alderman McCarthy. Yeah, so, so back at, at the table, I, um, how do we want to try to prioritize? That's, that's exactly where I was going back okay. to. Do we want to? So, is complete streets in the top five priorities, do we want to roll it into infrastructure? Do you want you know? Do you want it to stand alone? Um, I would I would roll it in with with right away infrastructure. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a I think that's a good idea. And so, um, so I'm going to put that over here in my one of the priorities, one of the top five? Right, I mean, you mean right-of-way infrastructure? As and complete, it, with complete streets being included in that. Yeah. Okay, any? I would certainly lobby to have downtown be in our top priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thoughts, Alderman Lopez? Well, as uh, we just saw in the previous presentation, there's about to be three pretty sizable population centers added to the downtown. So I really think we need to not only examine the existing ones, but the what impact putting that housing uh, over in Marshall Street is going to have, for example, because I can't actually remember a storm where anybody cleared East Hollis Street. No, I'm not talking about just downtown for infrastructure. I'm talking about the downtown column that's in the sheet, which includes a number of other items. Right. So we're looking oh, at see. walkable, um, vibrant performing, um, and visual arts, more housing and, and residents downtown, ensuring the safety of downtown, attract unique businesses to downtown. So that is all in that. Yeah. And I think it's evident that they're not unrelated. Um, <clears throat> but I think what um, Alderman McCarthy is saying is that Although you could separate downtown out and say the arts piece goes under arts and culture, there are things that are unique to doing those sorts of things downtown that warrant downtown being a standalone priority. Am I correct in, in interpreting your thoughts? No. I, oh, I, okay. I, 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 I agree. I, I just think where we are as a city right now, we're at a point where what we need to do next is to make our downtown very successful. Mm -hmm. right. That makes the difference between the sort of large, small town that we have been in the past to the small city we inevitably have to become. Uh -huh. um, and I, I think, you know, we're, we're at the cusp where that's doable because those projects are coming in and are, and we have a, a substantial investment in in the downtown coming. Uh, we need to figure out the rest of it to make, you know, the, uh, to make the, the storefronts fill in with whatever. Uh, we are very successful at becoming a gathering place for eating. We're having moderate success at becoming a gathering place for arts and entertainment. Uh, I think we need to concentrate on those things because those are what is likely to draw people into population centers in the coming future. Um, I, I don't think retail is coming back the way it used to be. <laughs> it's 
not now, not ever. So, you know, I, I, I think that's a clear place that we have to concentrate. Um, there are a number of things we have to do citywide, particularly the right of way and public transportation. Uh, I guess I would, I would say those are probably our, our top things. I'm tempted to include education in that, except from our perspective, we have so little control over that. There, there, it, it is clear that someone needs to figure out how to make sure we have a really good school system. We have a board to do that. Mm -hmm. Alderman Clements. I, I, I would agree um, with Alderman McCarthy. The, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the vibrancy of downtown, um, you know, people think, oh, you're, you, you're focusing a lot on downtown, and that's true. <clears throat> but downtown really is what makes Nashua what Nashua is. You know, we, we have outsiders um, will think of Nashua as the Pheasant Lane Mall or Amherst Street. Um, and, you know, that, there's nothing wrong with that. We definitely, as a city, we should support those businesses. They pay a lot of taxes and, you know, they employ a lot of people. Um, and they're, they're an important part of our city. Um, the fact that we have one of the most successful malls uh, still in existence, I think, speaks a lot to um, Nashua's location and to uh, what we can offer because we don't have a sales tax and things like that. So I think to support, to keep supporting those businesses is important. But what Nashua has never been able to capitalize on and what I, I have hope after the presentation that we saw from Paul Shea tonight, is getting those people that go to the Pheasant Lane Mall and getting those people that go up to Amherst Street to venture in a little further and come downtown and you know see what downtown has to offer um, because it, it, it's significant. And I think um, you know I think that's kind of a direction that that we need to go. That takes marketing. It takes um, you know, it take it takes effort. Uh, I think we can see the effort in in the sense um, of doing all the different events and things like that 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 are going to draw people there. Um, so you know, really, it's 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 a matter of promoting it. Part of it is too, you know, if you think about <clears throat> downtown Nashua versus a place that is a destination, let's say. Um, in New, using New Hampshire as an example, Portsmouth or Manchester. Um, Portsmouth and Manchester both have hotels downtown. Um, so if you're coming from out of the uh, from out of the community, you know you can go to Portsmouth. You can stay there for the evening um, and really experience everything that they have to offer. I think that would be a key uh, element for Nashua to have something like that. I think. Uh, in addition to uh, that, <clears throat> I'm pleased to see that there's going to be more housing around uh, downtown Nashua as well. Once you see, once you, I think we're at a point where we can really capitalize on these things. If we can, you know, get a, a, a hotel to get visitors to come in and, and stay downtown. If we can make sure that the people that are living downtown spend their money downtown and stay downtown and give them a reason to come downtown. That's only going to um, make, it's going to bring everybody up. I think you'll see uh, a lot of changes um, in the streets beyond Main Street. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it's all, it's all for the positive. So I, um, I think whatever we can do to market ourselves is, is the direction that we should be going in. Um, and we need to support organizations like Great American Downtown, Positive Street Arts, City Arts Nashua, things like that, the, the theater group. <coughs> I think having a performing arts center is, is an important uh, part of that as well. Mm -hmm. Alderman Lopez. So I always look at this as kind of like a backwards of the Field of Dreams uh, mantra. If, if they come, then, then they'll build it. So with all the new housing that we have, there's going to be more and more people downtown to attend events, to make the events bigger, 
to patronize uh, businesses, restaurants, and that kind of stuff. And I think a hotel would be absolutely willing to to invest in the downtown area as long as they're certain there's they're going to bring people in. Uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of resources in terms of like, here's our gigantic convention center and uh, and that kind of thing. But we do have a lot of art, like grassroots uh, arts organizations and a lot of uh, diversity and, and um, both economic and cultural is driving those arts programs. So I think if, if we can recognize that that diversity and that source population is a strength and, and, and target our housing, uh, our housing programs towards that, make sure that we're building housing for people who are artists, people who are going to those kind of events and, and will be living and patronizing downtown. If we stay focused on that population, we'll enhance the scene, the art scenes, the events, the activities and all that kind of stuff. We'll pave the way for the, the hotel to move in at some point, really make Nashua a destination. Um, and while I appreciate the, the need to bring young professionals into the city and ensure that this is where they want to live, um, I think making sure that they have housing where they want to live that's tailored to their needs rather than not giving them housing options that fit their particular needs and just having them take the housing that's available and then conform the neighborhoods around them to those needs, I think that's that's inefficient and we've been struggling against it. Whereas if we would just increase the affordable housing capacity, we would probably provide more patrons for the, the downtown businesses, which would in turn enhance the events and then build that support for additional stages of development. So I'm hearing um, the right of way infrastructure and complete streets is one, downtown is another, um, public transportation is another. Um, I, I didn't mean to, well, part of, I think, infrastructure, I think we should include the public transportation as, you like, as okay, under that up there. Okay. row. Um, because obviously it's a it's a big one, and I and okay. I'll just call it transportation. <laughs> um, one of the discussions <coughs> we had at the committee, and it it touches on um, what some of the conversation we've had here is the column um, titled "Economic Development: Integrate the Airport Airport Economy with City City Economy with the Airport." A milliard economic development attract businesses, affordable housing, and reduce the number of free and reduced lunches, hmm. which were viewed as together. Um, do we want to include that in one of our five? Um, I'm just putting it out there because there had been conversation at the committee. Alderman Lopez. I just really want to question what how reducing the number of free and reduced lunches is an economic imperative? It's a metric of whether you're succeeding in economic development. Well, I guess I can see that. I just always associated it more with education. But it's not based on it. It's based on income. Right. The, it's the, true, but I think the yeah. justification for free and reduced lunches is, is that it positively impacts education. Kids learn more when they're not starving. Yeah, and I think the... the uh, from the discussion when that item was put in, I think the intent was we ought to raise our average income to where there are not as many people who qualify. Well, I really like that that is looked at as a necessary benchmark because we can't really say that we're, we're knocking out of the park with economic development if we have a huge free and reduced lunch program. I just would want to make sure that it's clear that the solution isn't just to reduce the program, it's to reduce no. the number of people no. who need it. And and that was why it was put in that area, that um, as Alderman McCarthy said, it was viewed as if people have incomes and are living here within the city um, that they're able to live on and, and we have that economic development here, then we should see fewer families qualifying based on income. I think that would be my private definition that does not need to be changed here, but rather than, than reduce, I would say, let's improve the number of people who don't need free lunch. It's hard for people to be drastically accurate on a post-it. Yeah, I'm guessing. Alderman Clement. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, um, 
I, I look at that number, the re, the free and reduced lunch number, and I think it's, what, is it 50% in our schools right now? Well, is that what it is? Well, so almost 50%. <laughs> yeah. um, Nashua has always been a place that in, has inspired people. Uh, it's always been a place that, you know, people come to with, with hopes and dreams and things like that. And and, and I, I, I know firsthand because when I was in high school, I worked at um, – CVS is a my first job, you know, and there was a woman that had moved from Kentucky to Nashua, um, and she moved up here because she saw that in Money Magazine, we were the number one place to live, and she moved her family up here, and they were actually living in uh, the shelter, I think, on Maple Street at the time, um, and you know, she obviously, she was working at, at CVS and her husband had got a job, I think at that point at Teradyne. And it was, and the, but there was so much hope. And so when I see that free and reduced lunch, yeah, obviously we want to make sure that our students, um, you know, you know, obviously we want to take care of them and we want that program. But I think what it says, what it, it actually speaks a different way about Nashua and what it speaks is is that people come here because they they believe that by coming here they're going to have a better life and I think our city you know shows that um, you could live in you know I don't want to disparage other cities and get in trouble like uh, Governor Sununu did but you you look at other cities like Fitchburg you look at Lawrence you you know why why aren't people moving there? Well, there's a big reason why people aren't moving there, and that's because of they don't have a very good reputation. Nashua does. Nashua has great schools. So, you know, if you can afford to come here and live here, you're going to do it. Um, and, you know, I so I look at that as a, as a very different from just how well are you doing economically. I look at it like because we have that number shows that Nashua inspires hope in people. Um, and I, and I truly believe that. Alderman Lopez. I think that's a very fair observation. Um, I just think a number, as we start to approach 50% of students are on free and reduced lunch in the, our public schools, we just need to be mindful of the fact that if we're a place with a reputation for hope, we kind of have to make good on it. And I, if people are coming here for a difference, then we need to make sure we are addressing economic uh, development at all economic levels and making sure there are opportunities for people to climb the ladder. Because if we just strike and focus on, okay, well, we're a welcoming city and we have plenty of people who are going to come here and work the low-income jobs, and we're also going to have the college graduate uh, young professional crowd it has to be some give in between for people who are working non-traditional students um, and the like in order to really reflect that, that place of hope that we want to be. And I'll, and I'll only follow it up with I agree, but I think there's also an, a national element to that, that unfortunately uh, a lot of that is beyond our control. And, um, you know, so I, I think that that contributes to the, <coughs> the rise in, in that number. Um, but I think that there are things that we can do to make Nashua stand out amongst other communities, and I would agree that we need to do those things. So, I, I actually look at it a little different way. One of the complaints we hear from people who are locating businesses is that it's hard to get labor. So there is a demand for labor that is uh, <coughs> skilled, semi-skilled, and whatever. There's a workforce that wants to work. My other question is getting them together. You know, I, I, I've, I've often looked at it and said, the, the thing that's important in economic development is to make sure that the entrepreneurs succeed. Once they do that, and once you introduce them to their potential workforce, they'll figure out the rest of it. You know, nobody ever threw up their hands and said, I'm going to close down U.S. Steel because I can't get semi-skilled labor. If they can find labor, they will train them to do those those jobs. What you need to get is a workforce that's got the right 
the right work ethic and the right education to be, um, you know, inclined to work at the jobs. And I think the the employer base will take care of the rest of it if we do it right. So. Well. So to their to their point, um, if you look over in the column that says education, there's actually some items that talk about linking industry with higher ed or with schools. Would would you? suggest those be moved into economic development that we I think some of those are economic development right. I think a, a, right. a lot of education is mm -hmm. oh, Alderman Clemens had his hand up and then Alderman yeah I mean well and I guess what I meant by the national thing I mean y y you know you you can see that there's a disparity between you know the one the highest one percent and everybody else and that gap has been growing since 1980 and my this, that's one point. And then the other point is that New Hampshire isn't very competitive when it comes to minimum wage jobs. We have the lowest minimum wage in the country. So, you know, something's got to give at some point. And you, so if you want to get that free and reduced lunch number down in Nashua, we have to address those two issues. One, we can address on the state level as far as the, the minimum wage. The other one is a national problem. And I guess that's more of what I meant. There are things that we can do as a city to localize and make ourselves stand out amongst places that are around us, like Manchester, Lawrence, Lowell, um, Fitchburg. You know, I think, and, and those are the things that we should do, and they're what Alderman McCarthy was talking about. Um, and those are the local things that we can do. Um, and that, that was just, that was more of my point. Alderman Lopez? Um, to Alderman McCarthy's point, um, I think we should be more discerning about the businesses we have in Nashua and what our actual goals are in terms of bringing in employers and that kind of thing. Because I think we can try to cater to the needs of outside employers who might be a, a magic bullet that brings in another 130 jobs or whatever. But we have some pretty impressive small businesses that have grown right here locally. Uh, a great example being Excel Mobile, which is basically across the street. And they, they've, only start, they've only been, I want to say maybe four years that they've been around. Um, they're, they've been recognized several times by uh, Business Week and, and, and received accolades for how quickly and effectively they're growing. And I happen to know, because of my, my close association with uh, their director, that they haven't been hiring young professionals or experienced people. They've been cultivating employees from Nashua that want to work hard, want a chance, and are, are willing to do it. So they didn't need to go find a tech school and mine the, the, the brightest minds from it or anything. They just needed employees who would show up every day and could show up every day. And they've been very successful with their growth, particularly hiring people from right in the neighborhoods surrounding that are willing to work hard and, and, and do what they can. I think if we, if we encourage our own local businesses that are, that are positioned to grow, there's a lot of opportunity for us to create that bridge where people have the opportunity to improve their income and improve their means and then advance their education and, and the things along. I think if we try too hard to do it for them, if we try too hard to bring in the school and just like put everything side by side so that the system feeds itself, we're not necessarily going to serve the, the resources we already have in the city. Um, Along with that point, I, I would also like to kind of dovetail back to the, the public transportation. I think we are um, reducing the number of people who can generate revenue and, and make that jump um, economically by not providing public transportation on all seven days. Mm -hmm. I think we're also probably restricting the growth of the businesses that would cater to people because, you know, we're not shopping all seven days. Only the people that are that are going to the mall are able to shop at the mall if they drive versus adding that seventh day, it would let employers draw from a larger pool of employees. It would let the employees draw from a larger pool of employment. And economically, it would really help in terms of uh, increasing commerce on Sundays. Mm -hmm. McCarthy. Yeah, I just, I, I think we were in violent agreement on the point about employers and employees. We have a workforce that wants to work. Um, I, I, I think, you know, all we have to do is make sure that our employers know about that. Mm -hmm. It's not that we, you know, I, I think some of them say, well, 
there's no workforce because when they advertise through tr traditional means, they don't get resumes sent in. That does not mean there are not people in this community who can and will do the jobs that, that those companies have available. Alderman Clement. Yeah, I mean, I, I the, the biggest thing that any city or town or state can do to for economic development is to make sure that the businesses that are already in the city are happy and want to stay um, because you know if if you're constantly focused on trying to bring in the new guy um, you're going to create space for the new guy because the other guys who's already there is going to leave so um, you know, I think we do a good job with that now, um, and, you know, ironically, um, even though I think a lot of our public, uh, our public sector is going to not fare so well under Donald Trump, I think our private sector in Nashua will, with um, the increase in, in defense spending, uh, I think BAE is probably going to do pretty well. So um, we're in a unique position, again, um, to capitalize on that and make the best of, of, of a situation. And, uh, you know, I think, um, I think we're very lucky in that regard. So um, I'm assuming it's safe to report back that economic development with the, un the understanding that education is related to that is mm -hmm. one of the priorities we have. Um, Alderman Lopez. I'm not entirely sure what the city, If I, I don't think there is one at all, but what role the city plays in connecting applicants to employers. But I will say that from the work that I've done with the continuum of care with um, the Employment Connect event, and from my own experience uh, as a job developer for 10 years, I think a lot of the employers, and I hope some of them are watching, and take this as advice, but a lot of the employer's difficulty finding employees is self-inflicted because they set parameters and criteria for the ideal employee that are very difficult to not only meet, but just communicate. Because you can have highly qualified individuals who just aren't on the site that you're using. And you can have people with completely unanticipable, un unanticipatable skill sets and, and advantages and opportunities that you made the decision not to include them in your interview process. So I don't know if the city's economic development office has a role in it, but I would say creating some kind of location that's Nashua driven that says, this is where you can post your local Nashua jobs would probably be a very positive step because that's usually the first thing I used to tell people who are looking on larger websites is put the word Nashua in there and make sure you're actually applying for a job in Nashua. So I think it would be a way for national businesses to go to uh, an economic development site and say, I'm going to post my ads here so that I know I'm getting people from Nashua who are going to have a shorter commute to work, are going to have less barriers in the way uh, when weather or emergencies happen, um, and I'll be feeding the economy that supports my own business anyway. Where, where are we so far so on this list? So I have right-of-way infrastructure, complete streets, public transportation, downtown economic development. Um, the, the other one that we kind of combined, um, and, and I'm just kind of throwing some of these <clears throat> out, is um, we ended up with something titled Natural Resources. But it talks about um, improving parks to attract activity, develop a plan to upgrade and maintain city parks and fields, great parks and green space, um, access to recreational use of the waterfront, and vibrant waterway. So that was all put together as another one of our priorities. Alderman Clements? I actually think we do a great, I think we have a great parks department. I think we do really well we have the um i can't remember uh the title is her the waterfront manager yeah. or forgive me if i'm waterways, waterways, waterways right. manager and you know coming before and it's been it's it's been uh that position has been 
really reactive and 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 proactive too um but like i I, one of the items before excuse me one of the items before uh, finance this week is um herbicide for the nashua river um because there were complaints last year that past mines falls as you go towards pepperell uh the um you know, it was clogged with weeds and things like that. And it was a result of, the interesting part was it was a result of we got rid of the water chestnuts and then what happened was the milfoil filled in, which, you know, is a, is a, it's actually a huge problem across Uh um, the state of New Hampshire and it's, it, it ruins economies. Um, You know, Nashua, the Nashua River is actually one of, is the most, um, I think it has all of the invasive species in it, which is kind of sad. Um, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. but the fact that we're addressing it and the fact that, you know, these things come up, I think we do a good job with our green space. Um, so obviously, you want to continue to support that, but I don't know that it's something that needs a new direction or anything. I, I would just say, you know, in my opinion, keep up the good work and make sure that we don't lose focus on, on what we're doing. Yeah, I think the category also included some expansions of things we're doing, like buying the Mine Falls Dam and potential for solar energy. That, that Okay, that would be a good, yeah, I mean, if we the more we can do with solar and wind, I think that would be great. Any other thoughts? Alderman Lopez? I thought that solar energy might be under efficiency. I think that was, that was under another category. It was just what, yeah. Yeah. Just making sure that the, um, I mean, things like solar, which is basically cheap once we, once you invest in it, um, and then, or low cost if you have to maintain it, that, that looks like it would be like a, a way to reduce city costs overall. So, thoughts about any other things from this list? Do we want natural resources there? Do we not? Um, I had one other. Alderman Lopez. Um, under uh, public safety, mm-hmm. to, uh, well, I guess in the theme of what Alderman Clemens had observed earlier, we have a very effective public safety system, and there's a lot of really good work doing, being done, and it, it, it's sort of I don't want to change direction in any of it, um, but I did notice uh, address opioid crisis is is in there as a singular item, and I understand these might have been created on post-its, but that is a much more, that's probably something that connects with a lot of different issues, including the education, um, and then, um, well, a lot of other different areas. I think that's something that we do need to concentrate on because we've been very successful um, relatively uh, compared to surrounding communities in addressing the opioid crisis, but that's a a much longer term project. So I think we should be integrating a response to that into our plans because otherwise we're likely to lose ground when it isn't as publicly visible while it's still going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Given the way addiction works, it takes, you know, years for people to really kick the habit, rebuild their life, insulate themselves from relapse and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think one of the most efficient ways we can address it right now is to start intervention at a, at a younger age in the, in the school systems and to also uh, gear our, um, our public safety um, programs and, and the way that our programs are viewed, not just towards people who are traditionally perceived as, as substance abusers, but to recognize that there's a different population that's not only at risk but has no skills with which to uh, survive an addiction. If you're looking at the the people with means, they're a little bit more able to pay for things like insurance and, and, and treatment and that kind of stuff, but they're not necessarily able to identify the problems as they're coming. Um, recognizing loved ones who may suffer from addiction, uh, recognizing the difference between just recreational use and you know life-threatening uh, behavioral issues. So approaching that population as a, as a strategy in order to kind of carve them off 
from becoming our future addiction population, we're going to have to plan for that. I think that's something that we should put as a priority without just saying, okay, this is the same old, you know, population. They're probably homeless and they're probably, you know, what we, that's not what the, we're seeing in the epidemic at all. We're seeing people who have never impacted the system before looking for help. And I think if we, if we help those people too, and we have that, that strategy of, for example, I think one of the most, um, effective strategies that we've employed so far is by putting commercials in to chunkies so that everybody sees about the sees the resources the safe station initiative and all that rather than just you know posting something up where we assume people who have addiction will, will be going i think by doing that we're saving a lot of effort in the future because we're helping people find help early rather than later I, I would agree with uh, Alderman Lopez. I think that's that needs to be a pri sadly needs to be a priority. Um, <coughs> you know, I think it's it's also um, um, I don't I don't know where to put it though. I guess you would put it under public safety, but um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't know. So do we want, I will just add public safety to this. Anything else? We had asked people to, you know, three to five. Um, we indirectly have talked about education and its relationship to economic development. Um, the other areas, long-term financial planning, efficiencies, um, human resources and labor, um, library, um, land use, and city arts and culture were the other areas that um, if anyone has thoughts about rolling them under some of the things we already have or if there's something else. Well, I think... I, th I think land use probably just goes under economic development. Um, Alderman Lopez. Um, the library really only has one item in it. Um, ensure our city library maintains proper derived level of technology. So I, I could kind of see that either going under um, education most easily, um, or maybe even like arts and culture. I, I kind of, I think it might be easiest to just put it under education because that is something we can do something about. And the, I, as long as we're not holding ourselves to the traditional education that ends, in, at, ends at college, Lifelong learning and, and being a community of learning, the library is essential to that. And I will, I will just point out that this did not come from the library representative. <laughs> the library representative on the board um, or on the committee had um, things like, you know, in improving mobility downtown, increasing the downtown population. So. Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to library suggestions went into downtown. Yeah, or economic development or yeah, those sorts of things. Um, it, it could go into education. Um, this is also, I think, looking at the library maintaining um, levels of technology in some ways, um, they've talked about just what they have to operate um, and even some of the efficiencies in terms of working with AT within the city. So yeah, that could go either place. Um, does anyone have any thoughts though about another major area? Are we good with this? Alderman Clemens, Alderman McCarthy. You know, the, the only um, looking under HR labor I 
most part, you know, I think our, our city uh, workers do an excellent job, and um, I, I think we have a very efficient city, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm not sure where some of these, some of the comments come from under that particular topic, but... Uh, well, I don't think th these were negative comments so much as just people identifying things they thought were priorities as we move forward and things that we should be looking at it in terms of planning. Alderman McCarthy. I think some of that came out of the feeling that there were still um, inconsistencies between the various labor contracts that we needed to do some additional work on. You know, we've done work on health care, but there are numerous different sick time accumulation methods, et cetera, et cetera, and that more consistency would be better in the labor agreements. Yeah, but in no way were any of these mm -hmm. a neg something that was um, stated well, I, as I, a negative towards. I, I, guess, I guess I see the comment, uh, developing an effective, efficient city workforce as we have, one. we have one, and that's all I'm, and, you know, right. and I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, I was complaining earlier about the, the plowing. Yeah, that needs to be tuned up. It's a big part of it. But again, those people work tremendous amount of hours during those snowstorms, and they, in the, and where they plow, they do an excellent job. And the snow that they get rid of and everything else, the things that they do, the work that they do in the areas that they go to, you know, they do a great job. Um, I guess that could speak to a little bit of the efficiency uh, portion of it, but for the most part, I think our city workers do an excellent job. Yeah, and, um, and I would agree with you, and just, I think that, that this was stated in reference to continuing to develop them and provide okay. them with the skills they need, um, looking at it as part of succession planning, that we're grooming people to come through, and and that we we make sure that that's a priority. So those continuing ed things we do for people mm -hmm. across the city. So they really do have their finger on what's going on in their area of expertise. Again, I don't think it was that they're not doing a good job, but let's not let them right. just kind of right. get stale where they are, but that we keep moving people forward mm -hmm. and provide those opportunities. Because... We want them to do that, and that's part of succession planning. Yeah, grooming people to move into those mm -hmm. spaces. Yes, Alderman sorry, Lopez. I, I put my hand up I'm just sorry. I think you'll see the motion. Um, the uh, the two elements under long term financial planning: uh, reduce property taxes and take actions to maintain our AAA bond rating. I feel like those might fit under economic um, development aspects because I wouldn't want to arbitrarily cut programming just to reduce property taxes when people might who who are benefiting from those property taxes might also benefit from the programming but i think by growing our infrastructure and the base from which we pull uh revenue we could then reduce our our taxes and then by doing that responsibly i feel like any economic development plan probably needs to consider the value of the triple a bond rating in it we wouldn't want to grow faster than we're actually able to pay for right and, and I think that that was part of what was coming out of here. We were looking, if you look at the first item there, mm -hmm. um, focus long-range strategic planning to control tax rates, um, it, those were all really related and with the idea of if we're, bring, if we're building and improving economic development and bringing in um, additional commercial tax dollars, versus residential dollars. Are we able to use that to lower the property rate, the burden for um, homeowners in mm -hmm. the city? So I think this was, it, it is tied in with economic development, but it was really looking at that very broadly. <coughs> so shall I just, the four that we have? Yeah, can you just summarize it? I'm sorry. I have, yeah, that's okay. Right away, um, infrastructure and under that including um, complete streets and public transportation, downtown um, economic development including land use 
and education, I believe I heard, um, and public safety. And again, looking at these as big umbrellas for, for driving things, not thinking of them as projects. So if everyone is comfortable with that, I, we will take that to strategic planning. Okay. So I don't I'm, think. I will not be there on Thursday. You will not be there? We will miss you. Um, okay. I, will, I will be at the Northeast Astro Imaging Conference in New York. Oh, sounds like fun. Well, we will miss you. Um, what? So they're having that in the city with the most light pollution? No. It's actually not far from where I grew up. In oh, the okay, suburb. so not New York yeah. City, New York State. It's mostly seminars. It's not, it's yeah. not much actual observation taken. Oh, that's misleading. Yeah. Okay. Um, no communication, unfinished business, none, new business, none. Any other general discussion? Okay. Um, oh, public. Uh, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to mention I had a conversation with the community development director the other day about the trolley. Um, it has had abysmal numbers for the past month or two in the ridership. Um, we are we have established a new marketing campaign, but I think what we're going to do with it in the future is to run it for more hours in the summer and none in the winter. Really? So try to run it during the day on on Saturdays, for example. Oh. Written the bell over here. Okay, um, yeah, Alderman yeah. Lopez and then Alderman Clements. I just want to say, it has definitely been a flying Dutchman all winter because nobody knew it was still going. Like, it was marketed as a, a, a fun summer, fall kind of a deal. And I incredibly asked Paul a couple of times, that, is it still going right now? So I think if it was better integrated into, um, like, somebody's job or work, or even if, if it was, like, realigned so that when people have to move their cars out of the public lots into the parking lots uh, for some snow emergencies or something, people would love a trolley to pick them up and drop them, at least in the near vicinity of where they, they, they came from originally. But having it just tour downtown when nobody knows it's doing it and it's not we really an out-and-about time of year. That we do have seem. another marketing campaign underway. There has been a targeted Facebook advertising, which I have not run across, mm -hmm. but... Mm -hmm. There is I'm sure it'll work better now because it's a spring, but in the dead of winter, like it's it's pretty well known that January and February are very difficult times for downtown, and all, all that was doing was making it easy for people to park who weren't driving down in the first place. Well, I don't know. That seems odd to me because I would think that the ridership would be greater in the winter because <clears> you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be out in the cold, so you take the trolley. I don't know. I, 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 I'm kind of disappointed with the numbers. Um, one of the things that I said, and I said this from the beginning, was that uh, it, it doesn't run late enough. It has to run. I mean, our closing time is at 1 o'clock. It has to run to 1.30 in order for it to be successful. I, I, I truly believe that. I know that there are labor um, reasons why it can't, um, but I think we ought to try to work that out um, with the union um, if we're going to continue to do this because I think it'll be worthwhile to maybe do a sidebar or something like that to get uh, to get that running later uh, and I think it would be more successful if it did. Well and while we're on the topic of seasonal transportation um, this is the second year that we have run a winter bus in South Nashua to attempt to address some of the concerns people have about the sidewalks and walking on the sides of the road. And um, I received an email from someone who said, I just happened to see this. I had no idea it was even available and running through my apartment townhome complex. Um, and now that I know about it, I think you need to advertise it better and run it year round. <coughs> so I think maybe we need to really look at reaching out in all of these different places um, 
if we're going to provide transportation. But I just wanted to share that because you and I have had conversation. Yeah, yeah Alderman yeah, McCarthy. So everybody else is kind of, I had a conversation about that with the director as well, and apparently we've had we've had that because we were discussing that would be a good way to solve some of those problems is to have something that connected all of the residences with all of the businesses. And lo and behold, we have run it. We've had five riders on it. Right. And but I do I do think that like uh, last year the ridership was better. So I am I'm wondering what what the promotion was and how it was promoted. And do we really need to sit down and, and develop a strategic plan about to my kind of bigger concern developing South Nashua as a community and looking at that as part of what we do well, there. All the, uh, yeah. I actually think we just need to do a better job of of advertising our public transportation and and I mean whatever we're doing we're doing it to to places that the people who would use it are either there's no demand or the people who would use it are not getting the message. Right. Alderman Clement. You know, to, br to bring up what Alderman Lopez uh, said earlier, it, would, would it make more sense to, to, and could we, I don't even know if we could, but could we use that trolley money to, to open up a Sunday service? Even if it just ran, for, even if it only ran up and down, let's say the Danny Webster Highway, up Amherst and then back, I mean, the thing, you know, even something limited would be a good use of money. Over the nothing. Yeah, all the mimicry. I think that's going to be expensive because I think to do it in any reasonable way on a day, you have to run multiple routes mm -hmm. because otherwise you get, it takes two hours to get from, you know, the bus only comes every two hours that way. And I, it, it, I mean, it just... A route is going to be expensive, I think, to keep open. But, but even doing a limited route with limited hours that ran that that length for, let's say, I don't know, six hours. The destination that you're going to go, the destinations that you're going to go to those places, you're going to probably spend an hour at anyway. For example, if you're going grocery shopping and you want to go to Market Basket. So, so what if the thing doesn't come back for another hour? You're probably going to spend an hour in the store anyway. Um, same thing with the mall. If you don't like that, go out on Saturday. You know, like, it, it's, it's a service that we've never offered before, and it, we're trying to do it, you know, to, to enhance people's lives. And, and, yeah, maybe it won't be perfect, but I think, um, I, I think we should try anyway. Yeah, I actually took a quick look at some stuff the other day, and you, know, you think about it, if we were to do such a thing in the South End, for example, the people that it primarily benefits are the merchants who are located along DW Highway. Yeah. There is some $600 million worth of property along that stretch of land. Um, a business improvement district that paid for public transportation might in fact be the right solution to do that. And likewise for Amherst Street, um, there's similarly a very substantial portion of our of our tax base is located along Amherst Street and derives substantial good from being on Amherst Street. So maybe we want to look at that as to whether that's a potential way to fund the city share of the um, of the uh, cost. I think running that service year-round would would basically be somewhere in the less than a hundred thousand dollar range for the city for the city's share, but it's not cheap. If you're running two if buses you, up that route, um, well, that was one. that was considering running either one or two buses just on the southern route. Right. I. Yeah, I, how much are we spending on the trolley? Um, not that much. It's, I think it was maybe 15000 for the year. Can I make a comment, please? Oh, I'm sorry, Alderman Lopez. Um, so in discussing this with Director Marshawn, she pointed out that the infrastructure supporting the bus is also a cost consideration. So it's somewhat easier to run the trolley right now 
as an after hours uh, embellishment because you already have the dispatcher running and uh, the backup bus and the other services that support the bus mechanism in addition to the driver and the bus itself. So doing just a two route um, deal, it, it might look cheaper on paper, but it may not really pan out. I think building a meaningfully sized program would be an inevitability, but it might be something that you could at least pilot effectively to demonstrate to um, businesses that would be courted as investors that, hey, people will ride this. I know that personally riding the bus, I may run ride the bus more than any of the other aldermen. And the, the north-south ones are always full. Like they're very heavily used. And it's not just people going to the, the mall and Barnes and & Nobles and Market Basket. It's also people that are coming back downtown from Exit 1. Um, I've seen people who are coming down for events, people who are coming just to have dinner at a nice restaurant. They want to stroll. They want to walk around. Um, even people will come for church services and that kind of stuff. And if we, if we did manage to pull off a Sunday route, it would probably enhance uh, even the farmer's market and that kind of stuff. So people will ride the buses two ways. We just need to position those potential investors to see how many people would do it and how much they could personally benefit from it. I, I, I agree with that strategy. I think uh, I, I think it's a good strategy, but it's something that you know again we need to we need to talk about uh, and actually make happen. Um, and you know. It, 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 we're either going to do it with the city and we're going to do it with the city buses that are subsidized um, or contracts with somebody else because the union, you know, for whatever reason doesn't want to negotiate to be there on Sunday. I'm open to either, to either one. I think we should obviously talk to, um, you know, the workers that, that work in the city and say this is something, you know, if we get to that point to say this is something that we want to do and we want to open up these hours to you and, you know, but ultimately we, we, we really need to have service seven days a week. So maybe we should put that on the priority list. <laughs> Transportation. Yes. Actually, I have including Sunday. So there you go. I wrote there. Yes. Um, any other discussion? Public comments, I see no one. Um, any other remarks? I would just um, remind people who may be watching, um, April 5th and 6th at 7.30 at 175 Main Street, which is where Positive Street Art is, um, there's going to be an opportunity to comment on the reversal of the one-way um, streets downtown again April, Wednesday and Thursday of this week at 7.30 and then um, May 2nd at 7 p.m. there'll be a special Board of Aldermen's meeting um, to talk about phase two of the performing arts study so something you may want to keep on your calendar do I have a motion oh can I just make a quick announcement I was trying to look it up because I couldn't figure sure. out the location but uh, this Saturday, there's a coffee and coloring event through Positive Street Art. Um, I believe this one's at Georgia Bells. If not, it's at Riverside, but you could probably look it up um, on, on their Facebook page. But um, it's free to the public. It's literally what it sounds like. You, you go and you buy a coffee, and you can sit there and color and, and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of a we – we've been talking about arts and culture a lot this week, and it's kind of a way to reenter all of that, that scene. Great. Thank Great. you. Anything else? A motion? Alderman McCarthy. Move to adjourn. So I'll heard the motion. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, opposed. And we are adjourned at 925.